Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for our ongoing series of science sharing uh, webinars in Central Region. And today, uh, Jason Chowman from uh, WFO Springfield will be providing us a uh, looks like a very interesting uh, webinar on the three ingredients method for anticipating mesovortex genesis. Uh, this is part one of two, so uh, tomorrow at the same time uh, we'll have part two. So without further ado, uh, Jason, it's all yours. Uh, thanks, John. Um, uh, my name is Jason Shaman. I'm a forecaster here at the National Weather Service in Springfield, uh, Missouri. But before we move along, John, I'd, I'd like to say a few words. Um, uh, as most of you all know, uh, oh. we lost uh, a true pioneer in the field of meteorology, uh, that being Ron Presbolinski. You know, Ron's dedication and passion to QLCSs has resulted in uh, tremendous advancements in our science. Uh, these advancements have and will continue to save lives. Uh, Ron's work is truly going to live forever. Um, those of you that worked with Ron also know that his passion didn't just stop with the research. Uh, his kindness and passion influenced and touched us all. It was an honor and privilege for me to not only work with one of the greats in our science, but to also get to know a great human being, um, it's, it's, it's going it's to be hard to do these presentations over the next few days without Ron. But Ron, rest in peace. You're, you're going to be deeply missed. But, uh, moving along here, uh, as John mentioned, there's going to be a two-part presentation here. The, the first part, um, we're going to basically cover the three ingredients method for anticipating mesovortex genesis. Uh, the presentation we give tomorrow, again, at starting at 10 o'clock, will focus more on uh, QLCS, QLCS interrogation and warning strategies. Uh, overview for the presentation today, um, we're going to review the three ingredients method. Uh, this was actually presented or partially presented about three years ago in a webinar that Ron and I did. So we're, we're, we're going to uh, do some refreshing on the three ingredients method and what it's all about today, and then go into uh, the statistical performance of this method. Uh, we had a Hollings uh, student, McKenna Stanford, which is actually on the call today, uh, that did a summer study a few years back. Uh, we're going to present the results of that study, and then we'll briefly uh, preview the presentation that's going to occur tomorrow. Uh, just a quick refresher, when it comes to mesovortices, um, mesovortices tend to develop very low in the atmosphere. On average, and this is going back to some, a lot of work that's been done in the past, uh, Trap et al. 99, for example, these things tend to develop on average about a kilometer off the ground. Uh, I've seen them develop as low as a half kilometer and as high up as one and a half or even two kilometers. But the main thing with mesovortices is they develop very low to the ground. Uh, supercells often, uh, you got your mid-level mesocyclone, and they will descend with time to the ground. Now, obviously, you can get non-descending supercells also to where you get a, a low-level circulation that kind of just adjoins with the mid-level mesocyclone. But, and for today, we're going to be focusing, focusing on mesovortices. Uh, again, going back to some of the work by Trapp et al., uh, one thing we really want to focus here on this table is the height above ground these develop, which again is right around one kilometer on average. Um, you will see also in this table that Trap et al. did take uh, mean values of peak delta velocities, just adding your inbounds and outbounds together for your supercells, non-descending supercells, and the QLCSs. And you will see the, the, the peak delta velocities before tornado genesis tend to decrease as you get into the linear QLCS mode. But the, the two, two numbers we want to focus on here is that one kilometer above ground level, because that has huge implications for radar operators, and then also that lead time before a volume scans so of the, the peak delta velocity before tornado genesis. On average, we're looking at about one volume scan or roughly about five minutes or so before it's tornado genesis. So where does the lowest radar tilt reach that one kilometer above ground level? It's not very far out there. You're looking at about 40 kilometer, or 40 nautical miles out or so from an RDA. So 
Uh, just looking at southwest Missouri here uh, and southeastern Kansas, you see we've got all the radars there and the rings around them at 40 nautical miles. We're missing a lot of area here. Uh, generally speaking, we're going to be overshooting mesovortices beyond 40 nautical miles. Uh, that's, a, that's obviously going to be a big problem for ra radar operators, especially if you're looking to issue a severe thunderstorm or tornado warning upon mesovortex detection. So what can we do to uh, get more accurate and timely tornado warnings, severe thunderstorm warnings? Uh, given that these mesovortices develop so low to the ground and they're very hard to detect far away from the radar, and on top of that develop very quickly with little advanced warning. What else is there out there? Are there any other cues from an environmental standpoint, a radar standpoint, that can support better warning accuracy and lead time? <coughs> I'm sure you all are familiar with the, the whack-a-mole game. Um, there are a lot of radar operators throughout our agency that, again, tend to wait for mesovortices to develop and then blast out tornado warnings. Well, again, there's just not going to be much accuracy and lead time in playing the whack-a-mole game with these circulations. So how, how can we advance some of the great work that's already been done out there in the, in the QLCS front? Back in 2012, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Ron and I did a, a presentation on the three ingredients method for mesovortex genesis and strong intensification. Uh, as you will see there, there are the three ingredients. Uh, ingredient number one, we're looking for a portion of the QLCS in which the system cold pool and ambient low level shear are nearly balanced or slightly shear dominant. Uh, we're looking for that to be co-located with a region where Linomal bulk shear and magnitude is greater than or equal to 30 knots. Finally, uh, you're looking for some kind of a surge or a bow within that QLCS. So we want all three of these ingredients to be co-located. Now, Ron and I wrote a paper back in 2012 on this uh, that was presented, uh, presented at the SLS conference and also had an accompanying, accompanying poster. One thing we really want to emphasize here, really two things, is a, the work Ron and I did draws upon a lot of past work. Um, go back to the days of the, the RKW theory, Rotundo, Klemp, Wiseman. That's where a lot of this sheer cold pool dominant uh, ingredient number one came from. Uh, there's been a lot of great work done on ingredient three uh, when it comes to RIJs, bows. Ron's fingerprints are all over that one. Uh, ingredient two is a little bit newer uh, when it comes to the zero to three kilometer bulk shear, and, and specifically uh, the line normal bulk shear. That's probably the newest of the three ingredients. Um, one final thing we're on, I really want to point out when it comes to the bottom of this slide here, three ingredients method does not necessarily mean tornado. It means that a mesovortex genesis and strong intensification is favored. Uh, so as we get out later on into this presentation, and especially the presentation tomorrow, we will start focusing on key ingredients for tornadoes versus just mesovortex genesis and rapid intensification. Realistically, what we are looking for here is the most common form of mesovortex genesis. How can we predict the most common form of mesovortex genesis capable of producing some kind of a severe winds or a tornado? Not going to account for every mesovortex that develops. Uh, probably one of the more common ones that won't necessarily meet the three ingredients method is going to be a bookend vortex, a contracting bookend vortex. Uh, we, we actually saw one of those events here two or three months ago to where three ingredients weren't met, but we did have a contracting bookend vortex that did produce a tornado. So again, we're kind of putting the odds in our favor here, anticipating the most common form of mesovortex genesis. So without further ado, we'll just dissect each ingredient here. Uh, again, just kind of a refresher here from the presentation three years back. So ingredient number one, horizontal vorticity rotors. As we all know, uh, going back to our, our, our D-lock and A-lock days here, as a thunderstorm develops and puts down a cold pool, uh, it's going to spread out in all, all directions. You're going to get these horizontal vorticity rotors, if you look at the top left diagram here, that develop uh, along the edges of the cold pool due to buoyancy gradients. Uh, so you've got these horizontal vorticity rotors that develop. Now, 
picture a squall line and uh, looking at this lower lower left diagram here, uh, look at a squall line. Let's just say this is orientated north-south. Uh, we're looking at this advancing cold pool. You've got a cold pool rotor here, if you can see my cursor. That's developing on the leading edge of that squall line. Well, you've also got a, an environmental shear rotor. Uh, your low-level shear vector, uh, bulk shear vector, for example, when you've got this speed shear rotor that develops out ahead of the advancing cold pool, well, in combination with that cold pool rotor, you've got this what's called constructive interference that goes on uh, with the environmental shear. That constructive interference can aid in new developing updrafts, but as we'll show a little bit later, it can also be very beneficial for developing mesovortices. Now, not all constructive interference is created the same. Uh, in the example of a, a dominant cold pool, your cold pool is going to be overwhelming the environmental shear. Perhaps your environmental shear is very weak. Uh, your, your cold pool is much stronger. Um, in, in those situations, your updrafts are going to be rearward leaning and a little bit weaker. Uh, the rotors uh, developed by your system cold pool are going to tend to pull your updraft parcels back into the cold pool regions, though. Not going to be much tilting and stretching. We'll talk a lot about that here in a little bit. That's going on to any vorticity along that leading edge of the advancing cold pool with the dominant cold pool regime. On the contrary, oops, excuse me, you go into the dominant shear regime, you can see in this conceptual model, going back to the RKW days, you can actually see that horizontal rotor that is, has been developed by your strong environmental low-level wind shear. Uh, in these situations where your environmental wind shear is, is dominating your cold pool, your updrafts tend to be a little thinner and forward-leaning. Uh, in these situations, uh, again, going back to the three ingredients, you're looking for a, a, a slightly uh, shear dominant or a balanced regime. Uh, those are the two regimes that you're looking for when it comes to meeting the three ingredients. So uh, this is going to be one of those, a slight, uh, especially the slightly shear dominant regimes that you're looking for for mesovortex genesis. Uh, that, that other one we're looking for, again, is going to be the balanced. This is where you've got perfect constructive interference between your advancing cold pool and your environmental wind shear. Updrafts in this situation are going to be nearly upright and tall. You look at a, a VIL product or an echo top product, for example, or even elevated reflectivity course, they're going to be highest or strongest in this balanced uh, cold pool and shear regime. Uh, one term we're really going to be throwing around a lot in these, next two, uh, these presentations here is the updraft downdraft convergence zone. Just a fancy term for this interface here between your advancing cold pool and your environmental shear, um, shortened up UDCZ. Well, when things are going haywire in, in QL, during a QLCS event, we don't have a lot of time as radar operators to be slicing and dicing these QLCSs from a cross-sectional standpoint, uh, all tilt, so on and so forth. They're great tools, but one of the best ways you can conceptualize what shear cold pool balance regimes you've got going on is simply looking at your half-degree radar tilt. Uh, we've shown this slide a lot, but it, it, it's, it's a really a nice uh, presentation of all three shear cold pool balance regimes uh, going back to the super ratio. So look at the left image there first. Uh, what we've got there is a simple SRM plot at the half degree with the 0 to 3 kilometer shear vectors overlaid. First thing you've got to do when dissecting shear cold pool balance regimes is look for your updraft downdraft convergence zone. This is best depicted looking at a velocity plot or, or a SRM type plot. And as you can see here, very clearly shows up from around Stockton, down close to the Springfield area, and then getting down towards just east of uh, Shell Knob, Missouri here. This, this interface, you see it kind of gets bumpy here, closer to Springfield. That is your updraft, downdraft convergence zone. Uh, next step is to take that then overlay it with your reflectivity plot, 
where does that updraft downdraft convergence zone pass in relation to the reflectivity plot? As you will see here, start south and work north. Updraft downdraft convergence zone is out ahead of your reflectivity course. That's uh, indicative of a cold pool dominant regime. Once that UDCZ uh, gets right in front of your your stronger cores here, you will see that you've got a really good reflectivity gradient here. That's going to be your balanced area of the line. Once it starts curling back into the precipitation, that's when you get into your, your slightly shear dominant regime. Uh, not shown in this case, uh, when you start getting so much shear that your updrafts are literally getting ripped apart, that's going to be more your shear dominant regime. So don't have a, sh a, a true shear dominant regime presented here, uh, more of a slightly shear dominant regime. One other little feature I want to point out is this one, the inflection point. You're going to remember anything from these, these next two presentations, or this one and the one tomorrow, it's the inflection point. Keep track of that at all times. It's absolutely huge when it comes to mesovortex development. That is a big time genesis region for mesovortices. We see it time and time again. That is a zone of trouble. Inflection point is simply the area where you go from a balanced to a slightly shear dominant <laughs> regime. So right where that UDZZ starts to curl back into your precip area, that's the trouble spot, or one of the biggest trouble spots. I'll uh, give you another example here of a more compact uh, a bow echo system here. Again, first thing you got to do when trying to find your shear cold pool balance regimes is where is that updraft downdraft convergence zone on your velocity products? This particular case, you can see it's located from just east of Greenfield, Missouri, to west of Mount Vernon here, and curls back to between Diamond and Neosho, Missouri. Compare that to your half-degree reflectivity. You can see before I even pull this zip up here, you can see that gust front really out front and it down, outrunning it down south. So that's going to be your cold pool dominant area uh, back down to just west of Mount Vernon. Not a very big balanced uh, regime area in this particular one, but if, if it's going to be present, it's going to be just to the east of Greenfield, Missouri, and then you quickly go to slightly shear dominant uh, north of Greenfield here. Inflection point's going to be probably right in this area here, again, right where your UDCZ starts curling back into the precipitation area. I think we had three tornadoes that occurred with this one uh, in this general vicinity. Um, so, why does the shear cold pool balance mat matter when it comes to mesovortices? We touched on a little bit of this earlier, but we're going to get a little deeper into this uh, based on some of the, the latest research. Uh, you go back to Trapp and Wiseman 2003, and then especially Atkins and St. Laurent 2009, uh, they showed that tilting and stretching is maximized when the constructive interference is maximized. So again, uh, Constructive interference will go back to, goes back to your shear cold pool balance regimes. That's going to be maximized when you're either balanced or slightly shear dominant. Uh, going off of a graphic, again, from Atkins and St. Laurent, this is a really neat one here. Uh, a little bit complicated. I'm going to kind of walk you all through this. Um, just kind of follow this trace down here on this left diagram. This is just going to be ver a vertical vorticity term. You'll notice it's kind of flat line as we're following an air parcel. But you notice it really jumps up. That vertical vorticity or rotation really jumps up in this general area. Well, this is occurring with your parcel as, you know, following this Z plot here, the height of it, its height really jumps up in this same area. So what that's inferring is your vertical vorticity greatly increases as it starts ascending. Well, that's going to be your updraft region. Well, you will also notice one final thing here. Your dotted line here is your stretching term. Notice it ramps up in that same general area. So it is the stretching within that updraft that's really ramping up that vertical vorticity or your mesovortex uh, with these air parcels. So again, you need that constructive interference maximized, which is going to be your balanced or slightly shear dominant, uh, shear cold pool balance regime. Uh, go ahead and stop at this point and ask if there's any questions on, on shear cold pool balance regimes.
Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, move forward then with the quiz question. Are, are there any offices here, say, from the Ohio Valley region? Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky. John, I'm not sure if you've got tabs on that one or not, but um, any, any brave souls want to take a shot at this? Well, I see one person from Kentucky on here for sure. <laughs> yeah, this is Jackson. <laughs> and, and I see uh, Indianapolis. Let's pick on Indianapolis. <laughs> Y'all want to take a shot at time. this? Oh. I can hear you. Okay, I would say little or none. I'm going to go with, with false on this one. Um, cold pool dominant is definitely going to be detrimental to mesovortex genesis, but uh, those types of systems that are cold pool dominant can still be prolific wind producers. Um, th this was obviously a hellacious wind event here back in 2012, uh, where you had a, a forward propagating MCS that just plowed through. It started out in eastern Illinois. I think it was a mixed mode there, but uh, quickly transitioned into a forward propagator that dove southeast into the Appalachians here. So while it, it didn't really produce me much in the way of mesovortex genesis, there were a few weak ones on the leading edge. Uh, this thing obviously put down significant winds. Um, the key with systems like this is even though your your constructive interference may not be maximized when a system's cold pool dominant. As long as you've got enough there to overcome uh, any kind of capping inversion, which there was very little in the afternoon of this event, as long as you're, you're getting parcels up to that LFC, you're going to keep regenerating updrafts and, and keep a system going. So that's what happened in this case. And had a, a ton of thermodynamics this day, huge capes, uh, huge theta E differentials. So quite a wind producer, uh, this particular system. Go ahead and move on into uh, ingredient number two here, uh, which is going to be your, your line normal bulk shear magnitudes. Again, kind of going back to that that horizontal vorticity uh, slide, uh, that kind of that that peanut butter and jelly when it comes to uh, the, the regimes here. Looking at the environmental shear side of it, this is best uh, assessed using your bulk shear vectors. That, that's that's going to best represent the horizontal vorticity available in the ambient atmosphere out ahead of a, a squall line, a QLCS. Uh, but more specifically, it's the line normal component of this bulk shear that's going to best depict the horizontal vorticity available to interact with the actual updraft downdraft convergence zone. If you look at the image there from northeast Oklahoma, uh, just to give you an example of this, you'll notice these, these zero to three kilometer bulk shear vectors plotted are nearly line normal to, to the northern portion of this line segment there. So your, your, your line normal component is going to be darn near the actual bulk shear magnitude of these vectors uh, for this cold pool to interact with. In contrast, down south here, you'll notice that the line normal component is very poor as these vectors are nearly parallel to the advancing cold pool. So very little in the way of a line normal component here. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that we, we tend to use the 0 to 3 kilometer layer because it works well when it comes to the actual depth of the advancing cold pool. In other words, that advancing cold pool on average is about 3 kilometers or so in depth. Uh, you get further back into the cold pool, you're probably shooting up into that, that four or five kilometer range, as, as Brian et al., for example, showed back in 2005. So that three kilometers is kind of a proxy for the depth of the advancing cold pool. Maybe a little bit deeper in the warm season, maybe a little bit shallower in the cold season, but three kilometers that we found is a very good proxy there. Calculation for line normal bulk shear is pretty straightforward. It's simple trigonometry there. I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide there, but uh, 
uh, you're basically taking the sign there uh, of the actual bulk shear magnitude, and you are able to comp uh, com quickly compute a, a line normal component of that. When it comes to selecting bulk shear vectors, whether they're RAP, NAM, or as we'll show here in a little bit, the SPC mesocyte, you want to make sure you pick vectors that are representative of the ambient atmosphere out ahead of the line. Uh, you'll see in this particular slide here, we're out 20 to 40, 50, even more uh, miles out ahead of this line. You'll notice how the vectors, once you get near that squall line or even into it, have actually veered around a little bit. Uh, those are contaminated vectors. They are not representative of the ambient atmosphere. So make sure you're looking out ahead of your area convection when it comes to selecting the vectors. Now, if you're using model-generated vectors, you want to have a QPF plot on it also because models breaking out QPF, especially convective QPF, it's quite possible those are contaminated too. So try and find an area where you're not breaking out model QPF or, or convection when it comes to selecting the proper vectors for the ambient atmosphere. Uh, we worked with the Storm Prediction Center a few years back to get these graphics generated. Just plucked this one yesterday, actually. Um, if you go into their multi-parameter fields, you'll notice the bottom two entries there does have lots of 0 to 3 kilometer bulk shear vectors. Uh, you'll notice in this particular plot that once you hit that true 30 knot threshold, uh, the vectors change in color. You can see over southeastern Missouri here, even southwestern Missouri, they change in color into more of a cyan and get a little bit more magnified. So that's where you're hitting your 30 knot threshold. Uh, we've got some other parameters uh, plotted on here, going back to the paper Ron and I did back in uh, 2012 for SLS. Uh, we've got, uh, depending on which one you select there, mu cape or ML cape, but we've also got uh, theta E differentials. Uh, both of those, those parameters, the, the capes and the theta E differentials, can be indicative, indicative of um, just the strength of cold pool or potential strength of your, your prospective cold pool. Uh, once you get those big cape, uh, big theta E differential days, they are, uh, you're just looking at more shear cold pool potential. Uh, one thing to really point out here, these are bulk shear vectors, not line normal bulk shear vectors. So you get a QLCS going on radar here, uh, you, you're wanna, we don't want to take the line normal component, do that quick trigonometry there. So. Don't take the vectors verbatim. You've you got to do the quick math to, to calculate the true line normal component. Go to ingredient number three here, um, where the rear inflow jet or some kind of enhanced outflow causes a surge or bow within your line, your QLCS. Now, these come in all shapes and sizes. We're all very familiar, again, going back to some of Ron's work over the years. We're all very familiar with what a, what a bow echo looks like may not be as familiar with some of these localized surges. Uh, and we've got an example or two for those, of those coming up here. What we've found that these localized surges within a bigger bow or QLCS tend to be the ones that produce the mesovortices. Uh, one thing we really want to emphasize is that it's much easier to detect these surges, these little surges, these little areas of where your cold pools enhance with velocity products, your V or your SRMs. Um, these bows and surges are really kind of just lighting the match of sorts when you've got your other two ingredients present. They're the ones that really get these mesovortices going. So when it comes to identifying surges, um, don't be looking necessarily on the leading edge of the convection. Again, once you start getting into a, sheer, uh, a slightly sheer dominant regime, these surges are not going to be on the leading edge. You're going to be back in the precipitation region of your convection. Uh, that, le that left diagram there uh, from the super duration day says it all. Uh, you've got a, a developing surge here in your Ever Everton, Missouri, which is well back into the precipitation. So that old adage of worse is first is not necessarily true with, with, with a lot of QLCSs. Now, this right image... It kind of does fit that old conceptual model to where that surge is developing uh, more towards the leading edge of the convection. But even with this one, you've still got some, some, some weaker 
maybe some stratiform precipitation out ahead of the line. That's why you've got to look at the velocity products, because with neither of these, you don't see some honk and bow echo here with any of these in the reflectivity. So be looking at your SRM and velocity products. Uh, here's an example of the localized surges. When I say localized, uh, you go from north to south to these things, they're not very big. You see three specific ones here, uh, basically between Miller and Mount Vernon. And you can actually see mesovortices trying to develop just north of the apexes of these surges. Not showing up very well in the reflectivity up here. So again, just cannot emphasize enough. Be looking at your low-level velocity products to detect these. Now, obviously, you have the precursors that are to these that are taught within the larger bow echo, like these rear inflow notches, or, or maybe looking for a mid-altitude radial convergence. And just, just a, a classic bow echo here. Uh, uh, these, this image is from Ron from a, an event back in 2011 that we did some research on. Uh, the great thing about bow echoes, they're not only are they evident, but you can see them quite a distance from radar. And in this particular one, you can actually see uh, an impinging uh, mesoscale rear inflow jet uh, impinging on this bow echo uh, region here. What was neat about this particular event is this line initially as it came in through north central Missouri was just kind of orientated more northeast to southwest. Well, if you look at these zero to three kilometer bulk shear vectors out ahead of the line, that would have been a poor line normal component of the zero to three kilometer bulk shear. Well, this line tended to pivot with time and became more favorably aligned with these vectors uh, in this general region, basically north of your bow apex. So what would have been a poor mesovortex producer or potential mesovortex producer became a much more favorable one as that line impinged on the Mississippi River there. A uh, quick note about mesovortex tracks. Um, they will almost always, if not always, stay on the updraft, downdraft convergence zone. They, they're not going to be in some random places. They're, they're always going to develop on it, and they will stay on it. Oftentimes, they will migrate northward or poleward along the UDCZ into the precipitation region if you've got a slightly shear dominant region. This is going to tend to occur when you've got slightly stronger values of 0 to 3 kilometer bulk shear. You need those stronger values to, to be able to get a slightly shear dominant region of the line. So once you start getting into that 35 or 40 knot range of line normal 0 to 3 kilometer bulk shear, that's when you're going to really start getting your, your slightly shear dominant region showing up. That's when you're going to get those mesovortices tending to migrate north along that UDCZ into the precipitation region. Now, you will also get mesovortices that just tend to stay anchored uh, on the leading edge of the line just north of a bow apex with your near balanced region. That tends to happen more when your, your shear is closer to 30 knots. It also seems to happen more when you're into the warm season a little bit. If I had a guess, don't have any pure numbers to back this up. It's, it's oftentimes 50-50, whether or not you're going to get migrators to the north or they're going to remain anchored. The ground relative track of a mesovortex is the sum of your QLCS motion and any kind of poleward migration you have. And, and as you'll see, uh, especially in tomorrow's presentation, that's something to really keep in mind when it comes to drawing a polygon for a severe thunderstorm or a tornado warning. So putting the three ingredients together, uh, go back to the super duratio days. Where are we looking for the genesis of mesovortices, the most favored area of genesis for mesovortices? So let's go ingredient by ingredient here with the, the super duratio day. So where along this line is the 0 to 3 kilometer bulk shear magnitude greater than or equal to 30 knots? Uh, so kind of eyeballing the vectors there along the updraft, downdraft convergence zone, which we have traced out this time in this, this right image. Probably going to be this area highlighted in orange here along the updraft, downdraft convergence zone. That right there would be about your area that's got a line normal component greater than or equal to 30 knots. 
Uh, you get down too far south here, those vectors are darn near par parallel to the UDCZ. Poor line normal component down there. You're looking at uh, what's probably going to be um, at least a slightly cold pool dominant, if not cold pool dominant portion of the line. So ingredient number two, where is my line balanced or slightly shear dominant? Again, comparing the UDCZ to the precipitation plot there, the, uh, the reflectivity plot, I should say, it's going to be this light blue area where you're either balanced or slightly shear dominant. Finally, go to the third ingredient. Where do I have a surge or a bow along this line? Well, the larger scale bow is going to be from uh, near Republic, Missouri here, back to just west of Reed Spring in this, this, this darker blue area. However, we've also got some local surges going on here closer to Willard and just north of Republic itself. So you can certainly make a debate here, an argument, for drawing some, some dark blue in, in these general areas. So where are all three ingredients co-located? Well, I'd say for sure in this general area from just east of Republic down towards Reed Spring, but I would also probably throw in this area from just south of Willard down to just east of Republic. So just kind of connect this whole general area. That's going to be the area most favored for mesovortex genesis and, and rapid intensification. Now, with this bow, general bow, moving towards the east-southeast, we would anticipate, anticipate mesovortices to develop in this general area with that genesis region generally tracking towards the east-southeast with time. So again, if you're a radar operator, where am I going to draw my tornado warning up? That's the type of thing you're going to want to be thinking about along with where your mesovortices are going to be tracking over the next half hour to 45 minutes. And indeed, as we fast forward there a little bit, we've had three mesovortices develop as this line, this bow moved off to the east-southeast. Uh, from just uh, right around Taneyville here to up towards Sparta um, in, in Christian County here. We've actually also got other mesovortices going on up here uh, north of Springfield and up towards the Bolivar area. A lot of these mesovortices up here were uh, more related to the bookend vortex, while the mesovortices down to the south were more related to the three ingredients being met in, in that, that genesis area. And uh, as you'll see here, we had quite a few tornadoes that day. A lot of these southwest to northeast moving tornadoes came from your genesis region uh, where the three ingredients were met, while a lot of these, these more south to north type tracks were more of your bookend vortex tornadoes up, to the north, up in the northern part of this system. One more example here of applying the three ingredients method. This was more of a cold season event that occurred uh, in October, uh, I, think, I believe it was back in 2012, uh, again, first off, where's my updraft, downdraft convergence zone? Uh, you can see it traced out here in the right image. So where are my 0 to 3 kilometer bulk shear magnitude greater than or equal to 30 knots? You know, you've got a northeast vector here anywhere between 30 and 40 knots, so I'm going to probably put that line normal greater than or equal to 30 knots from uh, right, right along the, the Green Christian County line here, back to east of Miller up towards Greenfield, Missouri. Where is my line balanced or slightly shear dominant? Well, again, we're looking at that updraft, downdraft convergence zone. Where does it get right to the leading edge of the, the reflectivity grading here? And where does it start curling back into the precipitation? That's going to be your area of balance. And then further north, slightly shear dominant. So we're going to give that light blue area uh, where we're meeting the, the balance, slightly shear dominant criteria. Uh, finally, where is the RIJ, or enhanced outflow, causing a surge or bow in the line? Well, it's not shown here, but we really didn't have a true rear inflow jet with this system. But we did certainly have, as you can see, uh, looking at the, uh, the velocity here, and even showing up on the reflectivity, we had a larger scale bow uh, with this system. So... That's going to kind of be your boat area here. So we're meeting all three ingredients from just east of Miller down into the, the panhandle of what's Christian County here. So all three ingredients being met in this general area with the larger scale bow moving here. So we're looking for this area of east of Miller down towards the county line. 
that's going to be the best area for mesovortex genesis. And there, once again, is your inflection point. That's going to be your biggest area of trouble when it comes to mesovortex genesis and rapid intensification. So what happened? Well, we go a few volume scans later. We, we, we had actually several meso mesovortices develop in this whole general region here from east of Miller, Mount Vernon, up to just southwest of Willard. Uh, you can see a, a pretty decent mesovortex here just to the southwest of uh, Willard. Um, and we did have a tornado that developed and actually went through the south side of Willard uh, with that mesovortex. So moving forward, you know, you're, you're doing the, the forecast a day in advance, two days in advance, uh, expecting the potential for a QLCS. How do we anticipate mesovortices in advance of a system? First, we've got to de de determine the potential for a QLCS. Uh, we've gotten pretty good at doing this over time. I say we, the agency, has gotten pretty good. The Storm Prediction Center, you know, they're throwing this in their, their day two outlooks, day three outlooks. Uh, I've gotten pretty good at that. So determine if a QLCS is possible. If you do determine a QLCS is possible, how is it going to be oriented? Which way is it going to track? You know, and that's where you're starting to get into, are there force, forcing mechanisms involved that would line these things out? Uh, you go back to the recent dial study, I think it was back in 2012, where you start talking about convective modes, supercellular discrete versus linear. Forcing is a big player in something like that. Um, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a bunch of cold pools conglomerating uh, with cells, and you start getting that upscale growth into an MCS or a QLCS, that's, that's when you're starting to look at your core feed vectors or your your forward propagating core feed vectors if you've got very aggressive uh, cold pool behavior. One thing to really point out over the last three, four years or so, look at your high resolution models. You go to the SPC SSEO page. A lot, of the, a lot of our offices now are running the high resolution models. Look at those. Take a look at those and see what they're generating in terms of potential QLCSs and especially the orientation of them. Get a feel for which way these things are going to be orientated and tracking. And then compare your, your, your model vectors to them. Your, your 0 to 3 kilometers bulk shear vectors, again, in the ambient atmosphere, not where the model is breaking up precipitation. So you, you, you get confident that a QLCS is going to develop. It's going to be orientated the right way with the vectors. You know, your vectors are 30 knots plus where you're going to have a good line normal component. How do you advertise it? Well, there's several ways. We're all familiar with the HWO. Uh, you can get a little more specific in those. As you can see, there's a couple of examples there towards the bottom of the slide. Uh, don't be afraid to advertise this, or uh, if you're communicating with your core partners, um, this is something you can advertise in conference calls or, or the media, uh, for example. You have a briefing with them. Hey, we're going to be looking for surges or bow echoes that go towards the northeast. Those are the ones we're going to be watching very closely for the spin-ups. So you, you can certainly have enough confidence to advertise mesovortex potential literally even days in advance. Jump into the, well, go ahead and stop real quick here, make sure there's not any questions on, on the three ingredients method and how to uh, not only anticipate mesovortices in advance, but uh, dissect radar data when it comes to anticipating where these things are going to form, uh, form uh, even a couple volume scans in advance. So any questions up to this point? Go ahead and move on then. Um, you can all see this is a study done a few years back. Um, McKenna Stanford, uh, who is on the call with us today, uh, came in here a couple summers back and uh, examined what ended up being 30 QL QLCS cases throughout the Midwest. You can see the domain picture there uh, in the lower right image. Um, one thing I do want to say is we're not going to go into every specific detail on how we went about doing this research. Uh, we do have a website that's completely denoted to every fine detail of this research. So I'm going to go through the, the general basics here and to what was found. So if there's any specific questions, 
on, on, on the research. We can hit that towards the end of the call here, or I can point to that website. But one thing we really tried to do here when it came to picking 30 QLCS cases is hit different offices, different RDAs, but then also uh, cases that vary by size and times a year. In that particular uh, Excel uh, spreadsheet there, you can see that there's some cases in light red and there's some in light blue. Um, light blue cases are going to be your cold season cases, October through March, while your warm season cases are depicted in red. So a little bit biased toward, there towards the warm season, but we do have some cold season cases uh, in there. So when it came to documenting mesovortex and surges, um, closely examined radar data uh, through using GR2 analyst and every occurrence of a surge or mesovortex was documented for all 30 cases into an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you can see a screenshot example there of some of these. When it came to criteria for actually logging or documenting a mesovortex, it had to have a rotation of velocity greater than or equal to 10 meters per second. It had to persist for at least two volume scans. And it also had to reach a depth of 8 kilofeet. Uh, this, is, this is criteria that Ron Presbolinski had determined. Uh, his studies throughout the years, he wanted all three of these to be met uh, for class classifying something as a mesovortex. When it came to documenting a surge, this is probably the one most uh, up for debate. And we've got a whole spectrum here from sprawling bow echoes to localized surges. Uh, when it came to the localized surges, we were looking for something that displaced itself from the original updraft downdraft convergence zone by at least four nautical miles. Um, obviously, when it comes to the bigger bow echoes, those are easily going to meet that criteria. But uh, we really wanted to also include these local surges. So we were looking for those to at least displace themselves four nautical miles. Uh, you know, we've all seen the other visual cues to, to bow echoes and surges, but we've already mentioned on this presentation uh, rear inflow notches, uh, uh, mid-altitude radial convergence signatures, our marks. And then another thing we look at and see at times, and we're, we're going to show this in the presentation tomorrow, is new or enhanced updraft development immediately out ahead of the, the, the QLCS, that, that can also be a sign of uh, enhanced divergence to updraft development along the uh, line. So enhanced diverge, uh, convergence due to uh, localized surge. So once we, we logged all the surges and the mesovortices, we, we needed to determine the balance, a uh, shear cold pool balance regime uh, in the vicinity of each uh, surge and mesovortex. So what McKenna did there is, is logged all of those and classified those into five different categories. Uh, you can see them all there. Again, we were really keying in on those areas that were slightly shear dominant or balanced. When it came to determining the zero to three kilometer bulk shear vector magnitudes and directions, we had some custom plots generated using ruck and wrap analyses. And really would like to thank uh, Dr. Chad Gravel for generating these images for us for the not only the 30 cases, but many more that we'll use in later research. But uh, as you can see in these four panel plots of the, the wrap ruck analyses here, uh, what we've got in the upper left panel is just your zero to three kilometer bulk shear vectors. When, when they're ex at or exceeding 30 knots, uh, the, the, the vectors themselves and the magnitudes. But in the lower uh, left and right panels there, we've actually split them out into magnitudes and direction, which made it a lot easier on, uh, on McKenna to calculate the, the actual line level component thus in a second. Upper right panel, QPF plot from the model. Again, very important when it came to just, uh, determining what vectors were representative of the ambient atmosphere. You don't want to be ve picking vectors uh, where you've got model QPF there contaminating the vectors. So we took that model data. Well, we needed the uh, orientation of the updraft downdraft convergence zone to calculate the true line normal component. So for each surge, uh, we, we looked at the uh, portion of the UDCZ immediately north of the surge apex, since that's the most favored area for meso cyclonic mesovortex genesis. We calculated the line normal component for those. 
Uh, same thing with the mesovortices. Once the mesovortex initiated, we took that orientation of the line, uh, updraft downdraft convergence zone immediately upon initiation. We didn't want to go any further into the mesovortex lifetime because that often you'll get a skewed updraft downdraft convergence zone by that time. In other words, the mesovortex starts redistributing you, your UDCZ to where it's just not representative of of when your mesovortex first genesis uh, uh, develops. So medial upon mesovortex genesis is when we determine that line normal component. Uh, you will see uh, our spreadsheet here where we were calculating the line normal uh, bulk shear magnitude, specifically this light green uh, far column there. You'll also notice here in column W here where we had logged uh, the shear, actual shear cold pool balance categories. So some of the noteworthy numbers that came out of this uh, McKenna's work, uh, 67 mesovortices were identified uh, within the 30 cases. Uh, 64 surges that did not produce mesovortices were documented. 31 of the mesovortices produced at least one re wind report, and 21 of them produced at least one tornado report. Again, confirmed tornado, uh, and this was going from storm data. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize here is that several of the mesovortices produce more than one wind and or tornado report. So how did the three ingredients method do when it came to forecasting mesovortex genesis and rapid intensification? Again, not tornadoes, but mesovortex genesis. It correctly predicted 79% of the mesovortices that developed in the 30 cases and uh, falsely predicted 23% of them and had a uh, CSI of 64%. Uh, interestingly, there were two ingredients here that really shined. Uh, out of the 67 mesovortices which were identified, every single one of them had a surge or a bow that was associated with its genesis. All 67 mesovortices also developed in either a balanced or slightly shear dominant shear cold balance cold pool balance regime. So if you're a mesoanalyst working an event or anticipating an event, or you're a radar operator, areas of a QLCS that do not have both these ingredients present, probably not going to see mesovortices develop with them. You, know, you can still get your straight line wind thread, as we showed with that, uh, that duration in the Ohio Valley. But when it comes to mesovortex genesis, you don't have those, those two ingredients being met. Probably not going to be worrying about those portions of the line when it comes to mesovortex genesis. You can eliminate them for the most part. So you start getting into the bulk shear for mesovortices. You will notice that just plain old bulk shear from the, from the wrap, you will see that, generally speaking, looking at the box and whisker plots, left diagram here, Roughly around 34 knots or so of bulk shear or higher, you had 75%, again, looking at the box and whisker, 75% of them developed roughly from 34 knots or higher of just straight up bulk shear. However, you look at the line normal bulk shear, you will notice your lower quartile. So again, 75% of the mesovortices developed when your line normal bulk, zero to three kilometer bulk shear was 30.2 or greater. So this seems to support really well the, the work that Ron and I did back in uh, 2012 with the manuscript. That 30 knot threshold seems to work very well and did so in this, in this study that McKenna did for, for the 30 cases and the mesovortices that were developed. Going to the, the zero to three kilometer line normal uh, bulk shear for all the surges. So those surges that produced mesovortices and those surges that did not produce mesovortices. Those that produced mesovortices, again, this is that same plot we just showed on the right side of the last slide. Um, roughly 30, yeah, once you get to that 30 knot threshold or higher, 75% of the mesovortices had really hit well. Surges that did not produce mesovortices. You will notice while there's some overlap in this general area from 30 knots up to about 34, 35 knots, 
a lot of your surges had a line-normal component, but the majority of them eat less than 30 knots. So line-normal component less than 30 knots for the majority of your surges. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, p-values, uh, which kind of shows the statistical significance of the results, the p-value for this, this particular, these particular pots was well less than 1%, so uh, very high statistical significance when it comes to this particular plot. Bulk shear for non-mesovortex surges alone. So forget about the mesovortices for a minute, just non-mesovortex surges alone. And here's your, your bulk shear, straight up bulk shear plot, really straddles the 30 knot threshold for this one. Nothing too terribly telling here, but what is telling is you go into your line normal computed zero to three kilometer bulk shear, a lot of these data points were below 30 knots. This, this kind of shows why the line normal component is so critical when, when, it, calcu uh, when it comes to determining mesovortex potential. Most of these data points were below your 30 knot threshold. And again, this, this particular pot also had a very high statistical significance with a p-value uh, well below 1%. Real quickly, uh, these two plots here, bulk shear for wind versus tornado reports. Again, we are, we are completely relying here on the storm database. As we all know, and this has been just beat to death with studies out there. Storm database is, is subject to, to many possible errors. You may not get reports. The reports may be erroneous. Was a particular area of wind damage surveyed? Um, and there's even, even when they are surveyed, there's a lot of uncertainty with the surveys. There may be a lack of damage indicators, no road sim systems, et cetera. So completely at the liberty here of the storm database. But when it comes to these two plots, I think probably the most telling thing here, while there's a lot of overlap that exists, particularly with the wind plots here and the tornado, I think the one thing you can really garner from these is that when you get uh, zero to three kilometer uh, bulk shear at or greater than 35 knots, or more specifically, line normal values over 30, that's when you really get near tornado potential. You get line normal values less than 30 knots, looking at this, this right image, right box and whisker plot, the odds of tornadoes from mesovortices greatly decrease. So again, that 30 knot threshold for line normal bulk shear really seems to come into play when it comes to tornado potential. If you're not hitting it, odds are pretty low, not zero, but low, you're, gonna get, you're not gonna get tornadoes here. A couple of other noteworthy numbers as we get towards the end of this, this first presentation here um, that McKenna ca calculated. The average surge genesis, so again, surge starts to develop to the actual mesovortex genesis lead time was about nine minutes. Uh, you go from the average at mesovortex genesis to first report of wind damage from a mesovortice was about 14 minutes on average, all cases. Average mesovortex genesis to tornado lead time was 10 minutes, which is slightly more than that, uh, that trap study, for example, which is a little bit closer to five minutes. Uh, average surge genesis to wind damage lead time was 21 minutes, and then surge genesis to tornado lead time was 18 minutes. Those are two big stats there. Again, you go back to one of the earliest slides and we were talking about playing whack-a-mole with, oh, there's a circulation on radar, I'm gonna tore it. Well, that often offers you a five minutes lead time at best. If we're looking for uh, cues, whether on radar or the environment, to, to get advanced warnings out, those are the types of numbers we're starting to look at to get not only more advanced uh, tornadoes, three thunderstorm warnings out for mesovortices, but more accurate ones. So keep those numbers in mind. So keeping those numbers in mind, just kind of use a scenario here, a baseline scenario. What if we were to take every case we, of those 30 cases, every, every time the 380 ingredients were met and issued a tornado warning on it? How would we do? How would we do compared to Gipper goals? Well, the first thing that probably pops in your mind is, well, geez, there's going to be a lot of false alarm there. A lot of false alarm. We're popping out a tornado warning every time the three ingredients met. And as you'll see, 
looking at the, the three ingredients method and how it would perform, uh, 74% of the, yep, you'd have a 74% false alarm, so pretty high. We want to do better than that, but you know, when you look at true GIPRA goals, right around 72% or so for 2014, so pretty darn similar. As you would probably suspect also, you're, you really get a jump in POD. You're popping out a tour every time the three ingredients are met, up around 86% or so. But your lead time is right up around 18 minutes, which is a 5% improvement. If you're issuing a tour as soon as all three ingredients are met, 18 minutes or so average lead time. As we all know, different goals, when it comes to meeting this 13-minute lead time, a lot of that's probably going to come from supercells. You're going to get a far greater lead time or supercells versus uh, QLCS. Again, if you're playing whack-a-mole, waiting for mesovor to seize the form and get strong, you're offering little to no uh, QLCS tornado lead time. So using this 18 minutes as a baseline, you're going to get far greater lead time if you just went straight up tornado warning uh, every time you met the three ingredients method. Going to our next webinar, we're going to hit the, the QLCS radar interrogation strategy. We, we, we often ask ourselves as scientists, who, what, when, where, why, how? Well, there's not much who involved unless you're giving credits for research, but there's certainly a lot of when, where, why, and how. Prove it to me. Prove it to me why this stuff works. Well, we've covered a lot of the why in this particular presentation but we're really going to start covering the when, where, and how in the next webinar when it comes to radar interrogation strategies and then also guidance for issuing severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings or for IBW using tornado possible tags. We're going to build from the baseline scenario in the previous slide. Definitely not implying that we issue a tornado warning every time the three ingredients are met. We can do better than that. How can we do better than that? Well, it's with additional radar cues and mesoscale cues. Uh, one of my colleagues is sitting right next to me here, John Gagan, uh, came up with a term called weather ball. Uh, for those of you that have seen the movie Moneyball, which I believe was produced back in 2011, uh, it's a baseball movie, a lot of statistical analysis to put the odds in the favor of winning games in baseball. We're trying to put the odds in our favor to make sound warning decisions when it comes to these QLCSs. That's really what we're going to hit hard in the next presentation. Uh, once we cover those, we're also going to talk about polygon strategies for mesovortices. Playing whack-a-mole, trying to sharp shoot and get cute with, with individual mesovortices, you're going to get burned a lot. It's also going to create a lot of confusion with our customers out there if you're popping out small severes and torus for every little mesovortices, every little mesovortex, especially when you get the prolific mesovortex producing QLCS as well. Uh, that's going to be the bread and butter of the next presentation. With that, I know we covered a lot in this one. I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, we'll say here really quickly, um, we do have a website to noted due to our research over the last five years or so. I, I'm going to be given that in the next presentation tomorrow. Uh, we've, we've developed a Google site uh, that you all have access to already. So with that, I'm going to open it to questions. Uh, thank you, Jason. And I think we have time for a couple questions if there's any out there. Hello, this is John in Indianapolis. I'd just like to say I thought it was an excellent presentation. I appreciate the kind words, kind feedback there, John. Um, you will see uh, in the next presentation we actually did use a case from your CWA, an absolute fascinating case. Um, I'm sure you may know which one it is. Uh, we... Uh, very interesting findings with that one. We actually just completed a, a West case internally with that one. So uh, fascinating, fascinating stuff that went on in that case. Thanks, John. OK, 
Okay, last chance, last call. Well, Jason, thank you so much for your presentation today, and uh, we'll see you again tomorrow for part two.